Good morning. My name is Leah Lubin, and I am going into the ninth grade. Our scripture passage today comes from the sixth, passage, sixth chapter of the Gospel of Mark, beginning with the 30th verse. The apostles gathered around Jesus and told them all that they had done and taught. He said to them, Come away to a deserted place all by yourselves and rest for a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in a boat to a deserted place by themselves. Now many saw them going and recognized them, and they hurried there on foot from all the towns and arrived ahead of them. As he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd, and he began to teach them many things. Our second reading today comes from the second, book, ch second chapter of the book of Ephesians, beginning with the 11th verse. So then, remember that at one time you Gentiles by birth, called the uncircumcision by those who are called the circumcision, a circumcision made in the flesh by human hands. Remember that you were at that time without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Jesus Christ, you who were once far off have been brought near the blood of Christ. For he is our peace. In his flesh, he has made both into one and has broken down the dividing wall. That is the hostility between us, abolishing the law with its commandments and ordinances, that he might create in himself one new humanity in place of the two, thus making peace, and might reconcile both to God and one body through the cross, thus putting death that, has to, that hostility through it. So he came and proclaimed peace to you who were far off, and peace to those who were near. For through him, both of us have access to one spirit through the Father. So then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints, and also members of the household of God, built upon the foundation of the apostles, places, I'm so sorry, of the apostles and prophets, with Jesus Christ himself as the cornerstone. In him, the whole structure is joined together and grows into a holy temple of the Lord, in whom you are also built together spirit spiritually into a dwelling place for God. This is the word of the Lord. Yeah. Yes, yes. All right, let's pray. Thanks, O oh God, for your word, and we're grateful for your spirit who illumines your word for us, and we ask, O oh God, that we may have hearts to receive your word, and that we may have um, courage to proclaim and to live out your word, and we ask it in Christ's name, amen. Richard Cohen, a political reporter, told the story years ago of the day he took his boy, his boy, Ben on a train ride to New York City. The boy had been battling some illness, a rash of some sort, and had been uncomfortable. And so the trip into the city was first a trip to the doctor, but after the doctor's appointment, dad was going to take his son on a train ride. The boy loved trains, they were his passion. So the train ride was an ample reward for the boy having had to cope with this uncomfortable rash. So you can imagine how excited this son of his was to anticipate not only a ride on a train, but a ride on a train with his dad. After the doctor's appointment was over, they made their way over to the train station to take a ride out of the city and then to turn around and take their ride back into the city. And when the train arrived, father and son hopped on board, minding, of course, that gap between the platform and the train, always a little hair raising when you're trying to board a train with a young child. And after getting on the train and taking a couple steps in, Ben, the son, looked and noticed that his father had dropped his ID, his work ID, back on the platform. Look, Dad, your work ID, Ben said. Richard, the father, looked back, spotted the idea, told his son to stay right there inside the train while he jumped out to pick up the card. Just as he was picking up the card, he heard his boy yell, let me help, Dad. When Richard heard this, he instinctively held up his arm in that universal parental no position, but it was the very gesture, this gesture of protection, that knocked the boy off balance, and he fell through the gap between the platform and the train. Cohen describes the nightmare this way. I have covered bloody conflict from Lebanon to El Salvador. I have never known the razor sharp terror like that uncertain moment when a little person, your little person, is in mortal danger and you don't know what to do. 
I pleaded with the startled travelers not to let the doors close. Trains with open doors won't move. People were horrified, motionless, mannequins. They didn't, they didn't know what to do. My God, I quickly wondered, what, what about that third rail humming with electricity? Ben, don't move, I yelled as my eyes adjusted to the darkness down there. And I saw him half prostrate in front of a wheel twice his size. He was trying to get to his feet. Put your hands high up in the air, son. Put them up as high as you can. Two little fists clenched tightly appeared below the level of the platform. I dropped to my belly, scoop up the day's child I had knocked down there in the first place. No hero in the story, just survivors of a self-inflicted wound. Cohen goes on to write, in war, your number is up when it's up. Even at home on the battlefield that matters, our hold on life is fragile. Sometimes we only get one mistake. Our children can only look up at us. The trust in the eyes of a child is overpowering, especially when you know you have failed once and have been given a second chance. I'm not sure there are any stories I've heard or read that contain as much pathos as this story about a father trying to save his son. It doesn't take much to put ourselves in the shoes of that dad and feel inside our souls what panic, what yearning, what desperation, and ultimately what love we might have for our own flesh and blood, for our children to be sure, but love for any of our flesh and blood. While families can be quite uneven when it comes to the love shared between members, there is something quite intense that can flow out of a familial bond. We, we each have a, a family love story born out of a bond woven in flesh and blood. Maybe it's a child, maybe it's a parent, maybe it's a sister or brother or aunt or uncle or a cousin, maybe it's all the above. And we feel the intensity of such love at times of gravity. Gravity such as birth or death or illness or being apart or coming together. We experience this unique capacity for human love. Years ago, I had the unfortunate privilege to walk with the family as they walked with their son and brother down the path of a life-threatening illness. There are no textbooks for families dealing with the uncertainty and the chemotherapy and the radiation and the growing weakness and the upset stomach and the questions why. All there is, is love. And love does the best it can because this is our flesh and blood and you do whatever it takes for your flesh and blood. Weeks after the child succumbed to death, I sat at lunch with the father and listened. And at one point, he said that if there was anything he learned going through the hell of the ordeal, it was his capacity for love. He did not know he could love that much. I felt the same way the morning I watched the orderlies wheel my one and only child down the hall into major surgery. I didn't think I had that much room for love. Such love pushed against the walls of my soul. I've traveled to Honduras a whole bunch of times, and it's always amazing to behold what happens to people I've traveled with when they have stepped outside their comfort zones and traveled to a developing nation and entered into a culture and condition very foreign from their own, and yet a culture filled with wonderful and gracious people and children whose smiles and eyes could warm the coldest of hearts, good people who do not have two nickels to rub together, and yet whose hospitality makes you feel so much like kings and queens. Inside our one short week with them, bonds would form between these gringos and Hondurans, two different people groups who live two time zones away, bonds that seem stronger than the bonds we have with our American neighbors two houses away. And in the ride to the airport to fly home, around the van I could see smiles on my Presbyterian friends and tears in their eyes after having said goodbye and to hear them say in so many words, I never felt like this before. Which may be what Mark is trying to tell us in the few verses we read of his this morning, that tell of a time when Jesus sought to retreat with his disciples, and being far away in a boat in the middle of the sea, he and his disciples turned around and they returned to land, only to be met by this huge throng of folks eager to encounter the rabbi of Nazareth. And Mark says that when he went ashore and saw the crowd, he had compassion for them, for they were like sheep without a shepherd. 
He had compassion for them. This, this throng, this multitude, this mass of humanity, he saw them and had compassion for them, Mark says. The Greek word, the word that, word that Mark uses for compassion is the word splenizomai. It's the title of the sermon. I bet you were wondering, where the heck did I get that title from? Splagnizomai, translated it means to be moved so deeply by something, so deeply by someone that you feel it in the pit of your stomach. You feel it in the depths of your bowels. Jesus saw the crowd. And he was so moved, he felt them in the pit of the stomach. This was his capacity for love. They had occupied that much of his being. And of course, what immediately happens afterward is that Jesus feeds the crowd of 5,000 and his disciples see how far this love can go. Which I suppose is a part of what Paul is talking about when he writes to the Ephesians and he says that the mission of Christ was to those who were far off. For it was the case in the first century world that there were those who were near and there were those who were far off. And the ones who were near were the ones who had been chosen in the days of Abraham, God's chosen people, those who knew themselves already to be within the covenant family. And, there were, and those were the near ones, near to the promises and the love of God. And those, there were those who were far away. And these were the ones on the outside. These were the ones who were alien. These were the ones who were not following the law of Moses. These were the Gentiles. These were people like you and me. And Paul says, but those who were once far off, those who were once the outcasts, those who were once the aliens, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. That God has the capacity to love those who are near, and God has the capacity to love those who are far off. That God will go to whatever length to make sure that those who are near and those who are far are brought inside the tent of love. So then it makes sense that when Jesus tells the story about the runaway boy, you remember the prodigal son, who goes off to what? The far country and squanders his life in the sight, out of the sight of his father, that he comes back. And then Jesus says, when he was what? Still far away. Still far away. His father saw him and was filled with what? Luke says, he was filled with compassion. And the word he uses, right, splagnizomai. He was moved so deeply, he felt it in the pit of his stomach. And he ran and he ran and he put a big bear hug around his boy and he kissed him. This is God's capacity for love. And it is the commandment of God for us to love. And it rises to the level of commandment because it will always be the desire of God to expand our capacity to increase our proportion, to enlarge our dimensions for the neighbors who are near and the neighbors who are far away. God is always seeking to expand our level of capacity for people in the world who are especially afar off. Which explains when Peter went to Jesus and asked, how many times must I forgive my brother or sister? And then Peter throws out some ridiculous number in his own mind, and says, seven times? Is seven times enough to keep loving my brother or sister? And Jesus comes right back at him and says, oh, oh, Peter, oh, you can do better than that. How about 70 times seven? Because love is all about stretching your capacity, which explains why Peter is the one who gets the vision to travel up to Caesarea, far outside the borders of Israel, and meets there a Gentile Roman soldier, the epitome of the occupying force, the one who is so far away. Peter gets this vision to go to him and say, you too, Cornelius, and your family have been brought near. You are now inside the kingdom. Which makes me think of Jacob and Melody, a young couple who traveled to Honduras 16 years ago from professional jobs in New York City, and they got to meet the children of El Progreso, and the children began to take occupancy inside their souls. And Jacob and Melody began to feel the splagnizomai, 
And they began to wonder if they had room. Did they have room for one of these little children in their lives? Could they expand the walls of their souls for one? And could they expand the walls of their souls, if not just for one, maybe for two, or three, or 10, or 20? Was it possible that they could adopt as many children as possible and make them their family, show them the real love of a mother and father? And would their occupancy rate be able to increase to 5 or 10 or 19 or 29 or 39? How about 39? Yeah, let's try 39. And so it's 39, 39 children who are afar off, who were afar off beyond the help that anybody could give except for Jacob and Melody from New York who moved their lives to El Progreso and built a house with an occupancy level to fit their new family of 39 children. That's just a few of them. Many of our people have been there and they have seen this sanctuary of Splagnizomai. Now, is this sermon about moving to Honduras and adopting a family of 39? You laugh very awkwardly. <laughs> the answer is yes, and the answer is no. Yes, I know people who have done some crazy things because of the love of God. I know people who have moved to Honduras, who have moved to Turkey, who have moved to Ghana, who have moved to the Congo, all because of the love of God, which has moved them so deeply that they could feel it in the pit of their stomachs, and they could not help but expand their capacity to love. But not everybody is called to do that. I get it. Not everybody is called to move. But everybody is called to be moved, to be moved for those who are near and those who are far away. For those who are as near as our own flesh and blood, as close as those children who live next door, who were here yesterday to get what they need for school, those who are as near as the children we tutor and the families we feed and the homeless we house. We are called, we are commanded to be moved for those who are near. And also, we are called, we are commanded to be moved for those who are far away. As far away as the person who needs your forgiveness. As far away as the person who's not welcomed in your country club, the person who's not allowed across your border, the person who cannot fathom that God could love them, the person who's not sure if there will be enough money to pay the rent next month. God is always seeking through God's spirit to expand our occupancy, to increase our capacity, to make room for that splagnizomai, to get down into the bowels of our souls, the pits of our stomachs the bottoms of our hearts so that we might be moved. Let us pray. We bless you, O oh God, that your spirit is at work seeking to do something new inside each one of us, seeking to expand the walls of our souls and so we pray, O oh God, that you will give us another measure of your spirit. Challenge us to look beyond our short-sightedness so that we can see a world in need, that we can respond with your grace, and that we can love our neighbor near and far. For we pray this in Jesus' name.